Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jerry O'Brien. I am the editor for The Bulletin, and I want to welcome you here on the campus of OSU Cascades, where we're going to be talking about a couple of history books that are part of Central Oregon's history. Um, with me today is Kelly Cannon Miller. Miller. She is the director of the Deschutes uh, County Historical Society, and we're going to be talking about the first book, which is called Hello Bend, a pictorial history of our community from the 1950s until uh, 2000. Welcome, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Um, Scott, you could go ahead and put up the first slide um, if you can. So, gosh, how many months ago did you guys approach us? Six or nine months, I think. Yeah, six or nine <laughs> months ago. Um, the idea of doing a joint uh, publication between the Bulletin and the Historical Society came up. And I'm a sucker for that kind of project um, that we said, sure, we'd be happy to do um, a, a book with you guys. And we kind of, it was a great process talking to you all about what do we want to show with a pictorial history book that hadn't already been shown before. I think that was the thing for us is, you know, everybody knows about the old mills. Everybody knows about the mills and how you grow a town out of the sagebrush um, and the place where the indigenous peoples had used to call home, that story we've kind of, uh, you know, is, is there and, and present. But between 1950 and 2000, there's this whole other story that isn't being talked about and um, needs to be talked about more. And for us at the Historical Society, one of the pieces of this um, is letting everybody know about the fact that we contemporarily collect local history, like Things that are happening right now, we're trying to grab so that, you know, when COVID hit, everybody came asking us questions about the flu of 1918 and what it was like uh, during those years. Well, the only way we're going to be able to answer questions about COVID in 100 years is because we're collecting things right now. And between 1950 and 2000, there is a huge demographic and economic shift in the city of Bend. And that's a story that we're actively trying to capture and tell right now. And this book was a part of that for us. It fit very nicely with our mission to be able to do this book with you guys. So there's our cover on screen. And I have to give uh, Julie Johnson credit for the title as we were talking about how we how we proceed on the book, um, the idea of what we were going to call it came up. And so the story of how we get the name Bend as a city comes from Farewell Bend. Uh, that was the um, ranch that was on the bend of the river about where the Old Mill District is today. The urban legend history of it all is that as travelers would be coming through the area and would stop uh, and stay at Farewell Bend Ranch and they would head up through the trees on their way to either north or south, um, that they would say farewell bend to the ranch and uh, the river. Well, it was Julie that was the one sitting at the table and thought, okay, so if this is, you know, the second half of the uh, 20th century, during this moment in time where thousands and thousands and thousands of people move to the area, that logically the title needs to be Hello Bend. And that was her little stroke of genius uh, mm -hmm. there. So kudos That's to That's very appropriately Julie. named. Yeah. So um, as we got going on the project, uh, Julie Johnson, who's your city editor, city editor. Yes. For, for the bulletin, um, partnered with me on the selection of the photos, which, you know, what? We have, we have to make a choice. <laughs> we can't have every photo. We want to have all the photos. Um, but it, so we were partnered together. Uh, a good three weeks, we were locked together in a room at the Historical Society with a combination of photos that we had pulled from our archives, photos that lived in the Bulletin's archive, but then also photos that um, the public had been submitting to us, either on site at a scanning event at the Bulletin's mm -hmm. offices or that they had been bringing by the museum. So we pooled everything together that we had gotten from those three sources and started to work our way through um, how we could present a picture of this transformation. Um, the book is laid out at first by decades. So we go 1950, 60, 70, 80, 90, but then it became apparent that 
there were a couple of areas that deserved their own chapters. One of those is outdoor recreation, uh, and the other was events, and different events um, come and go during this time period that are really central to our sense of community and sense of place. Uh, so those became separate chapters all on their own. So um, if you want to go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, starting out in the 1950s, um, this is kind of what the layout of the book uh, looks like. That photograph actually was um, a postcard that I purchased for the museum collection off of eBay about 10 years ago. And I really, this was one of the photographs as I've been telling you guys that part of the fun part of this process for me has been Julie's perspective as a journalist and mine as a historian. Mm -hmm and the, how we approached these photographs from a little bit different angles. And, but this was one that was really, I love this photo so much and, and really wanted it in the book that uh, downtown then, every building had a neon sign on the front of it. You know, when you're looking at pictures of, of old downtown versus now, that's the startling difference is the signs and then now we have the trees. And boy, there's a lot to unpack in, in that uh, in terms of, of what a downtown looks and feels like uh, for people. So that's our shot coming out of the gate is, is downtown uh, in the 1950s, um, looking down Wall Street at all the neon signs. And town then was about 11,000 people. Um, so this is the start of this jump from um, 11, 12,000 people to over 100,000 people today in, in 2021. Go ahead, and next slide. So a big piece of this book becomes what are the choices that, that um, shift a community around its spaces and its landscapes? And um, we love that top photograph of it's very the Ben Bulletin newspaper the ben carriers. Bulletin newspaper boys, Can't right? Live without them. <laughs> yeah, but downtown also used to be what, as a historian, I would say it was a traditional downtown. That the shopping you were doing was your everyday shopping. So those bottom two photographs are actually the interior of the Piggly Wiggly <laughs> grocery store, um, which this is its Franklin location. Over time, they were in several different spots, but this is the Franklin location. It's a building that's still there today. It's a CrossFit uh, gym today. But that's, I mean, you were coming downtown to do your grocery shopping. This is before the malls. This is before the highway moves um, and all of those pieces. So you have this core where folks are coming um, and interacting with each other on a daily basis um, differently than how we see downtown today. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, of course, we have to talk about the fact throughout this book that the economic transition is from lumber to the next thing. What is, you know, this is the this is the five decades that uh, timber will continue to decline and decline um, until eventually all of the mills from Bend are gone, um, and that has such huge implications. You know, the the old mills when the mills were up and running. You smelled it, the sawdust in the air. You heard it. Um, everybody either worked there or your business depended on, on the economy driven by um, the sawmills. So there's no way we, you know, we have to start the book with showing how prevalent and dominant um, lumber was to the economy of Bend. And here you see up at the top the trestle that actually ran through Shevlin Park. So think about standing in Shevlin Park um, today and having a train load of logs come, you know, racing through. It's a totally, a totally different feeling, totally different experience. Um, it's also a time where we move from railroad logging to truck logging, which has a different impact on the landscape, and also um, from horses, which is one of the uh, fun things that I got to throw into the book, mm -hmm. was that they were using horses yes. for labor in the mill area well into the 1950s when the last horse was retired. Go ahead and go to the next one. Let's see what we have here next. Allen School. Um, uh, one of the major themes in the book um, and how the community has shifted and changed over time is the placement of the highway. And the things that, um, you know, someone makes a decision, 
you know, and down the line that the highway, the traffic is too heavy for Wall Street, so it's going to move to Third Street. Um, and then it's going to happen again in the 90s when the highway, when the parkway is built. Um, but Third Street used to be residential, and Allen School um, was a beloved school. Um, lots of folks around town still have memories of, of going to school there. And in one of the more famous fires that our fire department has ever had to deal with was a December 1963 fire that completely annihilated the school. It was built from like 400,000 board feet of timber. Timber, right. So um, it's almost all logs. Yeah, <laughs> and th it had been a chimney that had had a spark that was going and, and slowly burning. Um, and the story from the firefighters that night is that uh, the chief pulled everybody back just before the roof collapsed. So they escaped wow. the potential loss of, of several firefighters that night. So a very um, uh, catastrophic moment in the, town, in the town's history. But because the highway shift has happened and Third Street is now a highway, the decision to rebuild the school, it's not to rebuild on that spot anymore. So you get the shift to that's where Safeway is um, on the corner of Third and Flank Franklin today. So you start to see with this the shift from Third Street being residential and having its own neighborhood to mm -hmm. you know a commercial zone that has been plowed right through the middle of, of the neighborhood. Go ahead and switch. So those are the kinds of things that um, we have in the book. We have... Um, and that's a wonderful a cover photo. Can you tell us just a little quickly something about that? Sure. The, the funny story about this photograph. So that's Paul Hosmer. Everybody's familiar with Hosmer Lake. Paul Hosmer was the editor of the um, Brooks Scanlon uh, company newsletter called the Pine Echoes. And he was um, a wildlife photographer published nationally uh, in Life Magazine and lots of other places. And this picture everybody adores of he and his dog on, on um, uh, the lake that's so clear you can, it's like he's floating. Well, so I knew Paul's son, Jim, and every time he would come into the museum, that, that this photo gets credited to Paul Hosmer, but Paul's in the Paul's picture, there, right? <laughs> so every time Jim came into the museum and he would see this on the wall, you know, Paul's in the canoe. I'm the one that took that shot. So all credit to um, Jim for being the one to capture that classic moment of his, of his dad canoeing on the lake. Well, great. Yes. So this book will be available uh, by the end of November, last week in November or second to last week, probably around uh, Black Friday sales. Correct? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And, and also, if people want to order the book early, they can do so online. It's a simple uh, website. You just go to hellobend.com dot pictorialbook.com and you can order it for a, a reduced price online pre-order benefits yes, yes yeah. many benefits so. and, and i have to say that the book the the cut lines in the book are very interesting you, you'll just learn a lot about bend if you're a longtime resident here or if you're a newbie you can learn quite a bit from from this pictorial book so i, I encourage everybody to pick it up um, and also, if uh, I just want to remind everybody, if you have questions that you want to ask of, of um, Kelly and uh, the rest of our panelists tonight, please go to menti.com, www.menti.com, and enter this code. It's 6838627. And we'll take your questions at the end of the presentations. All right? Okay. So now I'd like to pivot to uh, another uh, well done his history book that is uh, written by three local uh, authors or three Oregonian authors. It's called Eminent Oregonians. And I will defer to uh, Steve Forrester, who happens to be our CEO and president of EO Media Group. And he will do some introductions for uh, the book Eminent Oregonians and his uh, compatriots who have helped contribute to this uh, well done history book. Steve? Thank you, Jerry. Well, this concept of eminent Oregonians uh, I developed about 30 years ago and uh, tried it out on a historian in Portland, Chet Orla. Uh, it never went anywhere for 30 years because I was engaged in daily journalism. But on my retirement some three years ago, I revived it and um, 
I was able to, uh, one, of the, one of the three Oregonians that I wanted in the book for sure was Abigail Scott Dunaway, who was uh, in shorthand Oregon's suffragist icon. And uh, I was fortunate in being able to recruit Jane Kirkpatrick, the celebrated band novelist, to write this nonfiction work. Uh, I approached Greg Noakes, uh, who has written a lot of history in his retirement from daily journalism, and um, <clears throat> I essentially said, I'd like you to write for this book. I don't know who you'd like to write about. And he said, well, uh, Jesse Applegate fascinates me, so I will do that. My uh, chapter is on Richard Neuberger, uh, who I have been fascinated with for some 40 years and gathered material on him for that long. And uh, I will talk about him in turn. So each of us will talk for 10 minutes about our character. Jane first about uh, Abigail Scott Dunaway, then Greg Noakes about, no, uh, about uh, Jesse Applegate, and then I will talk about Newberger. And then we'll take questions. So Jane. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to OSU and the Bulletin for having us um, this evening. I get to talk about Abigail Scott Dunaway, and as I was listening to the discussion about the then book covering 50 years, what struck me is that Abigail's life really covers the importance of her life is 50 years plus 12, because Oregon did not get women's vote until 1912. Um, but Abigail began her passion for the right for women to vote uh, in the 1850s when she came across the Oregon Trail after there were little you know, votes for women. <laughs> That, that, that's the kind of thing that women were born as, as they were working towards suffrage. So um, I thought I'd just talk about Abigail through some of her relationships because she was really such an interesting woman and had, had many relationships about who she was. And so one of the things she was is she was a daughter. And she was the third child, second daughter born um, to the Scott family, who ultimately had 12 children. And she was about 10 when her mother said to her, um, after delivering another daughter, um, how much she was sad that she gave her to her because girls had such a hard time. And um, at this time they were in Illinois, and her father, because of some business difficulties, wanted to go west. Some other family members had come to the room about it. Oops. Talk louder, please. <laughs> This is always hard for me because I, I think I have a strong voice because when I yell at my husband, the dog quivers. So I don't know, I have to talk about it. But I'll do that. I'll do that. Um, so uh, in 1852, the Scott family leveled up and headed on the Oregon Trail. Um, Abigail's mother said that they had always they'd come from Kentucky to Illinois and now they were going to Oregon. And she said they were always just at the edge of the frontier, and the frontier was finally catching up to them in Illinois. Couldn't they just stay and enjoy that? But um, that was not that was not the case. And in Abigail's novels, uh, the male characters, often the fathers, um, are pretty dominant, and they make the decisions. That's not necessarily what she desired in her novels, but that that's how the most female characters are shaped. So she uh, came west uh, in 1852, and because she had her own health issues, she was given the task of writing the journal. And a copy of the journal is at the Oregon Historical Society. And it's quite, uh, quite literate. She was really quite a fine writer, even at 16. She was basically self-taught. Uh, she didn't have uh, maybe a year of schooling, even though her brother, um, Harvey, was the first graduate of Pacific University. He was the only student that year that he was the first graduate. So they came west, um, and Abigail passed the teacher's test and was able to start teaching in a little town, kind of around Aurora and that part of Oregon, and uh, it's a little town called Cincinnati. And she loved teaching. Uh, she said that she would get up at 3 in the morning to study the lesson so she could be one step ahead of the students. But she also um, loved having her own income. Because during that time, uh, one of the things that Abigail was very aware of was the vulnerability of women. 
they didn't have control of their own money, uh, they their own property in their own name. Um, if there was a debt left by a father or a brother or a grandfather or someone like that, often the daughters um, or the wives were left to recover those debts. And of course, they couldn't vote. Um, so they couldn't make any changes in their lives, how it had to So she loved teaching. She um, fell in love with a very affable farmer, Ben Dunaway, and um, fortunately they were in love because um, they, the marriage was rushed uh, because, of, because of a decision her father made. Um, her mother and younger brother died on the trail, and her father decided that um, he would marry fairly soon. And there was a scandal of it because the marriage, um, after they married, they wife informed him that she was actually pregnant by someone else. And that at that time was incredibly um, dangerous for young women. So all the people in the Scott household, uh, all the girls, were quickly rushed to marry for a marriage age. And the others were all found out to live with those married sisters because it was considered really um, potentially scandalous that this had happened and that it would be influencing the younger girls and their reputations. So Abigail married. Um, she loved Ben. They, they um, had a little farm together. She called it a hard scrabble farm. It was a lot of work. And nine months and 20 days later, I guess it was, she had lived to her first child, who was a girl. And uh, Abigail then followed that with four other children, all of them were boys, who she referred to as voters. <laughs> and uh, she eventually, um, because of some decisions that Ben made that were poor, in terms of um, signed a note, and they lost the farm and moved into Albany. And that's when Abigail really sort of began being more involved in women's issues. And she started a millinery. She uh, ran a boarding house. Um, and not long after that, Ben, who was doing work on branches and training horses, he loved to work with painters, um, ended up leaving an accident. And so he had a lifelong disability that she later had to take care of. She was also a sister. She had several sisters and um, two brothers, one of whom died when he was in his early 20s in Oregon, and then Harvey. And Harvey became incredibly important because he was very well educated. Um, he was after he was um, graduated, he, became, he worked for the Oregonian, and then he took a job as a customs, uh, head of the customs department in Portland, and then was brought back to be the editor of the Oregonian. And Abigail, in her prime, as she became more and more involved in the suffrage, started a newspaper, which was very rare for less than, fewer than 1% of, of editors at that time were women. And maybe even, there's not that many even now, that we are women. And so, uh, and her newspaper, which is online, you can see issues of it, was called the New Northwest, and its entire commitment was to promote um, women and women's issues and women's rights. And she and Harvey um, had several intense kinds of experiences because Harvey was not in favor of women's suffrage. He was also not in favor of education paid for by the public. And, and, and I think that had some special meaning for Abigail because she was never allowed to have much education. And um, Steve and I have often talked about imagining what she might have done if she had um, been able to have some formal education. She went on to not only um, own, you know, own a lot of property, but became much more active in women's suffrage. She um, traveled all over the country, especially in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, to work towards women's things with those legislatures. She was in favor of the still hunt. It was called, I look at this because this was considered not too rabble rousing to wear a banner, but she was very much opposed to the um, more active street work of going into saloons and that um, some of the women's other groups did. She really wanted it to be um, one person at a time and convincing women and their husbands that it was in everybody's best interest for them to get There were six campaigns. Um, 
that Avenue was involved in from 1984 was the first main campaign until the last one in 1912, which actually um, did pass. But no other state had that many campaigns. And so there's discussion about whether Abigail was in fact a part of the problem in taking so long for women to get the vote. And uh, I like to think that, um, that that passion that she had was just unparalleled. And that we never would have gotten where we were, uh, especially with Harvey so very much opposed to women's votes and to have the influence that he did in particularly important area. Some things haven't changed in terms of the first campaign, especially where Abigail and her sisters convinced Harvey that he should come out in favor of women's suffrage because it was going to pass. And he wanted to be on the winning side, which is how Abigail had described it. And, um, and they, were, they were confident that it would pass because they had contacts in the more rural parts of the state where men were beside their women. They saw their mothers out doing the hard labor and beside their fathers. And, and they thought it made sense that women should have some say in the decisions that were made. Um, and so they miscalculated. And uh, Harvey did come out that only one and only time they came out with an editorial supporting women's suffrage and it um, failed terribly. And he never after that supported it. And so it was an ongoing um, level of tension in that Scott family. I often wondered what their family gatherings would have been like. Um, so the, the hope about someone like Abigail is that there is a, a, some of the modern reading about successful people and people who are able to persist over a long period of time. Um, and the, two of the qualities are that they have the ability to set a goal and work toward it. And certainly Abigail never faltered. She had her ups and downs. National organizations were ready to just write her off. Um, but she stayed with it because she really felt so passionate that this was the only way that we were actually going to make, you know, have change. Um, and the second thing is to be incredibly disciplined. And certainly someone who could write uh, 20 novels, uh, run a newspaper, engage her entire family in the newspaper, and stay with something for 50 years and do public speaking and travel around and use a typewriter on a stagecoach um, was definitely a discipline. And I hope that as you um, read the chapter that I wrote about her in this book, that you will come to see um, not only the strength of her, but also that she really is an icon. So I think of lots of Western women in particular, Oregon women who um, have passions for things and who have the discipline to Thanks, Jane. One of the uh, hallmarks, I think, of good biography <clears throat> is when uh, the author of the book, or in this case, the chapter, and then anyway, is startled by what he or she finds. And I know this happened with Jane, and I've seen it happen with um, others who have read her chapter, that the I didn't know that factor, and even the oh my god factor in terms of what life was like for a 19th century woman. And it definitely happened for Greg Noakes, who uh, knew uh, a bit about Jesse Applegate. And, and if any of us know about Jesse, it's the trail, the Applegate Trail. But as Greg will now tell us, there's much more to Jesse Applegate, who he was, and what he did. Good afternoon. I'm uh, speaking to you from my home in West Lynn, through the magic of Zoom. It's nice to be here, and thank you, uh, Steve and Jane. Always great to hear you. Um, yeah, I picked Jesse Applegate because not a lot is known about him beyond the uh, history of the Applegate Trail, and even that can be kind of a mystery. Um, on the screen, you see, if I have it right here, you're seeing a picture of Jesse, and it's a sketch. And we don't really know how Jesse appeared because he didn't want his photograph taken. He was kind of an odd guy in a number of ways, and one, one of the things that was odd about him is he considered himself ugly, and he probably wasn't, but because he considered himself ugly, he didn't want his picture taken. So this was taken, this sketch was done by a, a nephew uh, from memory a number of years later. Jesse was, Jeff, Jesse was one of four brothers, they lived in, in Missouri, and they both all were doing quite well financially. 
Um, but Jesse had problems with slavery. This became a big issue in his life. And uh, while he was fairly wealthy in Missouri, as were his brothers, he decided to come to Oregon. He learned there was free land out here. And so in 1843, he was one of the captains of the first major wagon train to Oregon, known as the Great Migration. And two of his brothers came along, uh, Lindsay and Charles. And here are their pictures. They didn't have any problem having their, their photographs taken. And um, I can't imagine that Jesse uh, looked terrible himself, but he chose not to have his picture taken. But uh, they were all, both of these boys and along the fourth brother, Lisbon, were older than, than Jesse, but they followed his lead and they all sold their farms. Uh, in Charles' case, his wife didn't want to come, but he said, well, we're going. And they went, they sold off their farms and headed out to Oregon on that 2,000 mile journey. And the red line is the Oregon Trail, which goes up by the uh, Columbia River from, uh, from Missouri. And you can see the dotted line here. This is the California Trail, which was established for folks breaking off from Fort Hall to California. And then this is the Applegate Trail. Now what happened in, uh, keep that in, in your mind, this goes up south into the Willamette Valley and people know quite a bit about that. Because the, in 1843, for the immigrants to Oregon, in, uh, there were probably a thousand of them in that 1843 wagon train. And coming down the Columbia River was a very perilous part of the trip. In fact, probably the worst part of the whole 2,000 mile trip. And a number of people uh, were lost here, including uh, Jesse and Lindsay, each lost a son in the river. They were in a raft that overturned and they were drowned and their bodies were never found. Well, as you might imagine, this was a great tragedy for Jesse and the family. And so in later years, they decided, or actually in 1846, just several years later, they decided to develop an alternate trail into Oregon, which was, uh, I messed things up here. So we're gonna go back to the beginning because I have to do it all over again. Sorry about that. So they developed this alternate trail, you know, from, uh, from the Willamette Valley down to connect with the California Trail. And this, uh, this is a, a picture of Shannon Applegate, who was a great, great granddaughter of Charles Applegate. And um, she was holding a drum that was on uh, the raft on which the two boys drowned. And while the bodies of the boys were never found, the drum was found uh, downstream. And that, dr that drum was carried by uh, the uh, uh, Jesse's grandfather, Daniel, during the Civil War. He was a drummer, drummer boy. So this is a photograph of the house that belonged to Charles Applegate. And this is near Yonkala in today's Douglas County. And each of the boys built homes in that area. Uh, originally, they settled near Salem, but um, during certain things happened, the development of the Applegate Trail by Jesse became very controversial. He was very embarrassed by the criticism of it. And so he decided to move uh, south to what was then the very almost devoid of any white inhabitants down in, uh, in the Yonkala Valley or the, near the um, part of the Umpqua Valley. And you can see they had quite elegant homes. The boys, when they came out, uh, these, three these three brothers uh, were not devoid of funds. In fact, I'll tell you here about Jesse's home, which is no longer existent. But in a life that moved between prosperity, renown, and ruin, the home Jesse built marked the peak of his good fortune. Jesse's and Cynthia's house, that was his wife, Cynthia, was on the lower slopes of Mount Yonkala along today's Eagle Valley Road where a state historical marker indicates the general location. Nobody knows exactly where Jesse's home was, but family records show that it had a 60 by 60 foot first floor with 10 foot high ceilings and a 30 by 60 foot second floor. There were nine bedrooms, a grand staircase, stained glass windows, a music room, and a well-stocked library 
making, making it unique among the homes of early settlers. Jesse imported expensive furnishings, including Brussels carpets, solid walnut, walnut furniture, and a melodeon, a type of organ. The home was more elegant than Cynthia needed or wanted, but Jeffy was driven to make it special. So this was another, the same photograph or sketch you saw earlier of Jesse. And I focus mostly in this book on his role in Oregon's great slavery debate. Not a lot of people know how, how much pro-slavery sentiment there was in early Oregon in that period at the time of the Constitutional Convention. Jeffy was, Jesse was ardently opposed to slavery. Um, and um, you can say that in, during the, he was elected a delegate to the Constitutional Convention where he took the leadership of the, uh, the uh, anti-slavery faction and said that in this quote is from the convention, the discussion of slavery by this body is out of place and uncalled for and only calculated to engender bitter feelings among the members of the body, destroy its harmony, retard its business and necessarily prolong its session. Um, the uh, convention did not approve slavery, but did enact a, a exclusion act against black Americans. And this is how that read. No free grower, no, no free Negro or mulatto not residing in the state at the time of the adoption of this constitution shall come reside or be within the state or hold any real estate or make any contracts or maintain any suit therein. And the legislative assembly shall provide by penal laws for the removal by public officers of all such Negroes and mulattoes and for their effectual exclusion from the state and for the punishment of persons who will shall bring them into the state or employ or harbor them. This was asserted third exclusion law in Oregon's history, the one in the constitution, and this was not removed until 1926. Well, Jesse was livid at the discrimination against blacks in this period, and he walked out of the convention and never signed the constitution. He considered it an embarrassment to, uh, to Oregon. I'm having troubles with my, uh, obviously with things here. So just bear with me, get back to this. So here we go, there's Charles House and the constitution. So, Jesse was kind of an odd guy in that he had a lot of contradictions in his life. And while I mentioned he was very much opposed to slavery, when he was in Missouri, he actually rented slaves to work on his farm because he wasn't able to employ white labor. There were no white laborers who wanted to do the farm work or anyway, that's how the, how the story goes. And so he ended up employing blacks to his great embarrassment. His wife also employed a girl slave and the family story is that she was ill and sickly and Jesse bought her to protect her from, from uh, a worse outcome than other might, otherwise might occur. But she finally passed away. And whether those stories are the right stories or not, we don't know because Jesse never said much about it. But he was opposed to slavery, came out to Oregon, fought against slavery. Uh, and he had that elegant house that you noticed a moment ago on the Mount Yoncala but it fell into hard times. Um, after developing the Oregon Trail, or the Applegate Trail, I should say, uh, which didn't go very well at first, a lot of the people who came out on the Applegate Trail had a great deal of difficulty getting to Oregon. A number of people passed away. Um, it took much longer than, uh, than it was supposed to take. Jesse had overpromised the trail actually was about 300 miles longer than it was supposed to be. And, Pioneers did, or the settlers didn't get into the Lambeth Valley often sometimes until about Christmas and going through a terrible winter. So anyway, the press and the critics were pretty hard on uh, Jesse, who at the time lived in the, uh, in the Salem area, but it was that criticism that caused him to move uh, south to Yoncala. But in Yoncala, he also, he, even though he had all his money to start out with, he lost all that money. And I tell that, that story in the, in the chapter in the book. But I'm pointing this out. You can see over here, this is down in the California-Oregon border, Jesse Applegate's house. And um, 
he would uh, he was forced to to give up his home on Mount Young Call, and he went to work for a fellow named Jesse Carr, who had a ranch on the Oregon California border, and this was an area where the uh, where the uh, Native Americans, the uh, Modoc tribe, was of were the was populated by the Modoc tribe, and they had been moved before Jesse came into reservation up here, Fort Klamath. But by after Jesse had settled here, some of the uh, the Modocs were discontented with their treatment in the fort and decided to move back to their homeland here around the Thule Lake. And of course, by this time, there are white settlers in this area who didn't like the uh, Modocs coming back. Anyway, that's a long way of saying this ignited the Modoc War, which was a very savage war. And Jesse has kind of an odd, odd role in this war. It's not very clear. He didn't write much about it. Uh, he tended to cite, cite with settlers on their, uh, on their conflicts with Native Americans. Uh, he had many, many Native American friends, but uh, he was... Um, he was represented by in Oregon as sort of a man of peace who tried to keep, to, uh, to keep peace between the Modocs and uh, the whites. And a recent book in California said it was quite the opposite. They have Jesse as being an instigator of the war, which I don't think was the case, but I can't, uh, can't prove that. This is a, a General Canby, Matthew, let's see, get my, General Edward Canby, and he was killed in the Modoc War, the only American general ever killed in a war with the Native Americans. It was a savage war, and um, eventually the Modocs gave up. You're seeing Captain Jack on the right and Shanj and Jim, on, no, Captain Jack on the left and Shanj and Jim on the right, and they were originally later surrendered and gave up and were hanged for their part in the conflict. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, and uh, so I'll pass it on back to Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So, uh, my, my subject, Richard Neuberger, is of course the only holy 20th century person in this book. Uh, Abigail Scott Dunaway lives into the 20th century and, and uh, dies when Neuberger is quite young. My fascination with Dick actually begins with my father. In the 1930s, he and Dick Neuberger met each other. Uh, my dad was uh, the sports editor of the Oregon State College, uh, now OSU Barometer. Dick was the sports editor of the Emerald. They also shared the same um, mentor in the uh, or the newsroom of the Oregonian, the sports editor there. And um, so the Newburgers would come to our home in Pendleton when I was a kid. And um, so I, as we say, laid eyes on him. And their last visit to us before Dick's untimely death at the age of 47 in 1960, uh, I was about 13 and I was <clears throat> paying a little more attention. And um, I sat across the lunch table from him, and he spoke <clears throat> at some length about falcons because he had just observed a falcon at a halftime at Portland's Multnomah Stadium the day prior. And the, his enthusiasm and his voracious intellect was astounding to my young mind, and it stuck with me. Uh, some months later, he was dead. Uh, as I mentioned in the book, he, uh, so many aspects of his life are forgotten today, and yet he is arguably one of the most consequential, if the most, if not the most consequential Oregonian of the first half of the 20th century. Um, Dick was, uh, by the time he dies, uh, at the age of 47, he had written or co he had written seven, some 750 magazine articles. He'd written or co-authored seven books. He was the first Democrat elected to the U.S. Senate from Oregon in 40 years. He was the second Jew elected to the U.S. Senate uh, following the enactment of the 17th Amendment, which required the direct, direct election of U.S. Senators. In the Senate, he was, the, uh, he was an original co-sponsor of the National Wilderness Act, which became the National Wilderness Act of 1964, 
and he was author of the Highway Beautification Act. He was um, he was many things, uh, which is to say, with all public figures, uh, whether they're actors or politicians, uh, there's an inner life that we don't see. Uh, in Dick's case, he was uh, an extreme hypochondriac, a uh, prodigious warrior, and um, this comes uh, becomes apparent in a letter that uh, his uh, the woman he was courting, Maureen Brown, becomes Maureen Newberger, also a U.S. senator eventually, uh, addressed in a letter to Dick from uh, Portland to him in Alaska during World War II. And she writes, uh, on the surface you present a jovial attitude and have such a good sense of humor that I know most people would be surprised to know that you were often tense and deeply concerned over many matters. At times you have seemed to me like a little boy who needed a lot of loving and someone to look after them. And it goes on from there. Uh, Dick responds to that very interestingly. He says, uh, uh, I am complex to you because I think a lot and worry a lot about the world, about my stomach, about politics, and everything. But that is my nature. Um, Dick's uh, administrative assistant in the U.S. Senate, Lloyd Tupling, said to me, um, Dick was the most insecure man I've ever met. At the same time, <clears throat> Newberger was a prodigy, and he was uh, very precocious as well. And where these two aspects of his character come together most vividly is in 1933. He's three years out of uh, Lincoln High School in Portland, He's uh, finished his uh, sophomore year at the University of Oregon, and he decides that he wants to take a he wants to do a reporting trip in Germany, where Hitler has just seized power. Uh, his uncle Julius is a physician, and <clears throat> um, is fluent in German. The family came out of Germany, and uh, so he talks Julius into going with him to Germany. They go to the family, uh, the origin of the family, which is in Heinstadt, Germany, and uh, with Julius's help and the help of townspeople, Dick gets off the beaten track. He doesn't do the tourist thing. He doesn't go to the big cities or anything like that. And he finds people who tell him what has happened to their children, uh, how they were taken away by the brown shirts and tortured and many, in many cases killed. Uh, it's sort of, it's, it, he's seeing the nascent brutality of the Nazi regime. Well, after their uh, some one month long trip there, they return to New York City and Dick takes this story to the New York Times. Uh, they won't publish it. Uh, Dick's mother told me later it was because they could not, felt they could not substantiate what Dick had seen. So he went down the street, so to speak, in New York City to the Nation magazine. And there he met an editor named Ernest Greening. And Greening paid Dick $38, commissioned the article, and it was called The New Germany. It was a mocking, it mocked the tourist advertisement that Germany was putting out in those days that it's the new Germany. The trains run on time, everything's cleaned up, and so on and so forth. And uh, this article is startling even today to read. We know about the Holocaust, uh, but this is a very intimate look at that. Um, you can find it online. I quote some batches of it in, in the book. Dick also wrote an even more uh, searing, vivid uh, version of the trip in Opinion, which was a journal of Jewish life and letters. Uh, my wife and I found the article in uh, the New York Public Library. It's not cataloged, and I would not have known about it if I had not happened on an article where Dick mentions that he wrote for Opinion. Uh, he comes back uh, off this article and he's suddenly, he's a national figure, especially in Jewish circles. Uh, his article, it, various renditions appear in all of the Jewish newspapers that were then common in the major cities in the East, Philadelphia, Boston, New York City, and so forth. Uh, he is on a panel at the National Jewish Congress that, that year. And he uh, suddenly is uh, recognized by the most prompt, some of the most prominent men of that era, and by Eleanor Roosevelt uh, as well. So Dick comes back to Oregon, 
has a very uh, troubled um, junior year at the U of O, uh, where uh, one of the major figures in his life, Wayne Morris, who we know these days as Senator Wayne Morris, the legendary opponent of the Vietnam War, was his law professor. And a couple of things happened there, but most significantly is that Morris flunks him in his criminal law course. And that propels Newberger to leave the university. So Newberger is one of those guys who never, had a, never got a college degree. Uh, there's a certain amount of mis misinformation about that, but I find they nailed that down that no, he, he did not graduate. Uh, so he, uh, he uh, runs for the legislature a few times, loses a couple of times, wins. And eventually, uh, after World War II, marries Maureen Newberger. Let's see that slide, if we could, please. Uh, and they become uh, what I call the, uh, the Dick and Maureen legislative franchise. Uh, in the photo that you will see there on the steps of the Capitol, it's a photo taken by a, a For Life magazine for an advertisement that Life was running. And uh, they, uh, it was very smart. It was not only played on Maureen's strengths, but it was very smart marketing on Dick's part to have both of them run in Multnomah County at the same time. The same name on the ballot twice, it just reinforced its, its excellent marketing. And it worked. So they, were, they served together in the 1950 legislature, he in the state senate, she in the state house. And he then is pondering his run for the U.S. Senate, uh, which kept sort of coming and going and coming and going. And finally, happens in 1954 where he challenges uh, the incumbent uh, Guy Corden of Roseburg. And um, Morris, through all of this, uh, is no longer the man who threw him out of law school, so to speak, but uh, his mentor and his advisor. Morris makes uh, several speeches across Oregon supporting him. Morris raises a prodigious amount of money for Newberger's campaign in the East. And the money is a, is a very important part of the story because it was the first time that a Democrat in Oregon had uh, competed on the money front in a Senate race. He raised something like $133,000. The uh, Republican candidate, the incumbent, raised $138,000. Uh, the bulk of Newberger's money did come from outside of Oregon. The Oregon that I write about in Dick's story is uh, the Oregon I write about, the Portland I write about, the, the state legislature and the U.S. Senate uh, are nothing we would recognize today. The Democratic Party in Oregon uh, in the, uh, when Dick starts out in politics in the 40s, uh, it was the reverse of now. The Progressive Party in Oregon were the Republicans, uh, progressives a la Theodore Roosevelt and so forth. And the uh, Democratic Party was, in the words of uh, the late Hans Lindy said to me, was very inarticulate and backward looking. Uh, really had very much, very little to say. Well, Dick had a lot to say, and what he talked about was liberalism. And we would not recognize that today at a time when, when prominent Oregon politicians vied to be more liberal than each other. And that's part of what uh, got in the way of Newberger and Morris's um, uh, collaboration in the U.S. Senate. It broke out into an enormously uh, vicious feud between the two of them. Um, if you read the correspondence, and I've read a bunch of it, there's even more I've not seen yet. Um, Dick wrote, clearly wrote his letters for history, and Morris simply unloaded on, on Dick. Um, and uh, this proceeded until, until Dick's death, really. Uh, one of the more uh, astounding assertions Morris made was that he felt Newberger was behaving the way he was because of the cancer that came upon him. It was testicular cancer, and uh, it uh, first appeared, I think, in about 1956. The, 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 the treatment he was giving, given at the time is not what we would recognize today. Um, uh, it, uh, it ended his life, uh, some would say very prematurely, but that's, that's how his story ends. Uh, Maureen uh, becomes, uh, runs for his seat. Uh, there's a widespread misconception that she was appointed. She wasn't. She, she won her seat. She was the seventh woman 
to be elected to the U.S. Senate following the 17th Amendment. Uh, and when she uh, was sworn in also was Margaret Chase Smith of Maine. And it was the first time that two women entered the Senate on the same day. So it was, it was a terribly historic moment. And with that, uh, I will stop and take questions, Jerry. We will, we will take questions, the three of us. Okay, great. Fascinating stories, all three of them, really. Um, remember, if you have questions, please uh, send them to www.menti.com using the code 68386267. Let me start off, though, with a question of my own, which is uh, for each one of you is... Uh, the, these folks are, are interesting in their own right, but is there something in your research that you found that totally surprised you, that took you uh, kind of uh, off guard? And uh, Jane, we'll start with you. I, uh, I was aware that she, uh, Abigail was um, prominent, and she's one of the six women of the 156 names that are in the Oregon legislature and the capital, you know, inscribed somewhere. And so I knew she was quite remarkable, but what I didn't realize um, was the importance of her speaking ability. Women at that time were not even supposed to be on stage. And, uh, and she could, from everything I could read, could hold an audience. And a lot of her um, speeches, there's a professor at USC who is um, enamored with her life and her work and he maintains the website and um, most of her speeches are there and if you read them it's it, it's stunning how she was able to articulate the fears of people who didn't want women to get the vote um, and and address them in ways that were non um, threatening uh, I would say and at the same time there are just incredible stories of of how witty she was and how acerbic she could be and um, and could put people off with her uh, sarcasm. So it was kind of that dichotomy of this great um, diplomat in many ways and at the same time someone who could be, um, who, could, who could send a group out of the room uh, screaming that they would never want to be in the room with her again. So uh, it's that kind of a dichotomy. And maybe maybe eminent people um, have that sort of dual um, dual characteristics. But I, I was surprised to see that. And uh, Greg, was there something w when you researched uh, Jesse Applegate uh, that took you by surprise? Well, one of the, re the main reason I wrote about Jesse was because I discovered his role in Oregon for slavery debates. I had not realized at this time how much pro-slavery sentiment there was in Oregon. So that was the reason I wrote the book. But one of the most surprising things that I got into the book were his friendships. He counted his close friends Matthew Deedy and Joseph Lane. The closest friend was Matthew Deedy. He was president of the Constitutional Convention pro-slavery throughout his life, argued for slavery at the Constitutional Convention, never gave up his, uh, his, his uh, affection for slavery, never apologized for it. He became a U.S. District Judge uh, for many years, and uh, partly he was forgiven for his slavery views at the time of the Civil War because of Jesse Applegate saying, this is a good man, um, he believes in the country, and, and they should overlook the slavery. And then Joseph Lane, who ran on a slave state ticket against Abraham Lincoln in 1860. And when he came back from that, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, election which he lost, he was apparently shot and ambushed by somebody who hadn't liked his views or for some other reason, fairly near Jesse's house. And Jesse took Joseph Lane into his home and nursed him back to health and later argued that Joseph Lane should be appointed a U.S. Senator of Oregon. So he had strange uh, strange bedfellows who kind of all mixed up there, but uh, Jesse separated a person's political views from their personalities and the character as he saw it. Yes, truly. And Steve, what about uh, Richard Newberger? Was there something in your research that you discovered that was unusual or, or took you by surprise? Well, I had not realized how badly he stumbled when he got to the Senate. Um, I, I knew about what's called the squirrels uh, incident, 
But uh, Dick was a master marketer. He knew how to sell a story, pitch a story. And so he noticed that there was a news item about uh, at the White House they were removing squirrels from the White House grounds so that uh, President Eisenhower could putt on his putting green, uh, not bothered by squirrels uh, in any way, shape or form. So Dick created a fund to uh, uh, raise money to, to, re to protect the squirrels, I guess, or remove them or something like that. It became, uh, and people actually sent money into this, as you would expect, uh, but he, he, he was perceived as not a serious player by people in Oregon and people in D.C. And um, he was, according to Tupling, his administrative position, he was quite distraught about this. Dick was distraught about this and realized that he could not use humor in that way. And uh, as Tupling said, that was the moment when he grew up in the Senate. Hmm. Well, perhaps some of those squirrels were shipped to Oregon, and that's how we got squirrels here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, uh, say, Steve, um, for, for Newberger, was he a victim of ethnic prejudice, and did he sponsor any kind of legislation to kind of curb uh, prejudice while he was in the Senate? Yes and yes. Um, he, uh, when he was at the University of Oregon, he, uh, as editor of the Emerald, this was in the Depression, many of the dormitories were, were half empty, and so he developed uh, what they would call the uh, Emerald's Housing Plan, and also the Emeralds, uh, I forgot, was it $1.54 a day eating plan or something like that for needy students. <laughs> and he really disturbed the peace down there badly. And so the fraternity crowd went after him, <clears throat> both overtly and covertly. And they put cans up around, <clears throat> the tin cans up around the campus saying, send, put money in here to send Dickey to school back east. And um, Neuberger, uh, as Maureen alludes to in her psychoanalysis of him, he was, he was excellent at absorbing these kinds of body blows and not letting on. And so his, uh, his response was very artful. He said, okay, we've had fun here, but, and we'll give this money to some student who really needs it, uh, you know, in school here in Oregon. Um, and on the campaign trail in 1954, the editor of the Sherman County Journal, Giles French, wrote about Newberger's, the, I think it was called the financial acumen or the financial brilliance or something of, of his race, which you know got the Jewish thing out there. Charles Sprague, the editor of the Oregon Statesman, responded with a very powerful editorial uh, responding to uh, French's uh, uh, bigotry. Uh, in, in 1956, I believe it was, uh, before he, no, 56, he's in the U.S. Senate, before he leaves the Oregon legislature, he and Mark Hatfield are co-sponsors of a Civil Rights Act. Uh, it's, it's essentially a Fair Housing Act. It's mainly about African Americans. Uh, and uh, then when he's in the U.S. Senate, in 1957, there's a Civil Rights Act uh, sponsored by Lyndon Johnson, who's the Senate Majority Leader. And um, it, it, it's, uh, it was all about giving Johnson li credibility as a liberal for the Northern vote uh, because Johnson wanted to run for president. <clears throat> uh, by the time the big show comes, which is 1964, Dick is dead. And uh, it's Maureen's turn on, on that one. But uh, the most, uh, in, at Oregon, uh, it was observed throughout the state what was going on there with him disturbing the peace and the kind of, uh, of uh, response it drew from uh, others. And uh, a journalist in Portland for the Jewish Scribe, a publication long since lost, gone, said uh, Dick Neuberger was badly treated for all this. He was tarred, feather, blah, 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 and if I may say so, anti-Semitized. Hmm. So that went on, but it was <clears throat> it was done in a way that today would seem very mild in the day of quote social media and the internet, where all of this would have been visual, visually and very very viciously. Um, yeah. So yes. Okay. 
Well, very good. Um, where can people find the, uh, the book? Uh, the Deschutes County Historical Society. And there are three other bookstores that are, are in the process of picking it up, and we'll be advertising that in the, in the bulletin. All right. And do we have questions from the audience? No questions yet. No well, questions yet. Um, one of the things that I'll throw out for all three of you is um, this book has, on the surface, three very different humans who are dealing with three very different, you know, modes of time. But yet there's some common threads between the three of them, namely that all of them have similar characteristics to be rather prickly. Um, I love when Abigail refers constantly to one of her um, nemeses, whose last name is Shaw, that she would write it as Pasha, um, a little biting wit. But all three of them have these leadership qualities, and at the same time, um, some crippling self-doubt um, from some of them. So just as a reader, uh, I appreciated that the three of you treated treated these figures as whole individuals who are living in, in moments of time uh, where some things are, you know, are unrelatable to us by our 21st century standards, um, you know, debating exclusion laws and, and slavery. And in that respect, um, some of Jesse's opinions were, were way ahead of his time um, for the state, and the same with Abigail um, and with Richard. So it, I appreciated you treating them as whole individuals, um, you know, for their their moments and and seeing there's a there's a common thread in their in their characteristics. I guess the question I would have for you is, do you think they had any sense of their legacy uh, when all was said and done? I don't know if Greg wants to take that first for Jesse. I don't think he did. Jesse was, uh, as, as you know not by now from the things I said, a very odd sort of guy. And he considered himself as being a person of no great consequence. And he made several remarks during this period. And I think he probably really believed it, that um, he tells, saw himself as sort of, sort of a, an emissary to helping make the world a better place, but not somebody who was actually doing the hard work. It was just another, another, another cog in the wheel. And there's a number of quotes that, that he had along this way, like, we will pass and we won't be remembered, but our works will be, will, will be behind us and we'll be satisfied with that. So um, I don't, he had an ego, but I don't think he saw himself as being that important, if that makes any sense at all. It does oddly, <laughs> and there were there's quotes. You know, there's some of the things that Jesse wrote that, you know, about equality, that you find yourself kind of screaming at the page, like stick in there, Jesse, fight this fight, you know, stay at the at the convention and and let this, you know, let people see what you're talking about with treating African Americans uh, as equals um, at the voting box and and in ownership of land and and not, you know, exclude them from the state. But um, I guess he couldn't emotionally get there. Um, Steve, how about how about Mr. Newberger? What do you think he thought in the end? Oh, he was I think he I think he was very conscious of of um, how he might be remembered. It all came and went so quickly, you know, He's dead at the time when most folks these days are kind of getting going, kind of in their careers or, or something. But um, interestingly enough, in the correspondence that the the nieces of Dick Nibber has allowed me to see, the wartime correspondence between him and Maureen, they're quite vivid in terms of the sexual longing, uh, his especially. And he at one point comments in a letter, he says, well, if people saw what I'm writing, it wouldn't do my political career any good, would it? <laughs> so he's very self-conscious in that matter, um, and and he wrote, you know, he wrote biography himself. One of his books was a biography of uh, George Norris of Nebraska, fabled a congressman, fabled at that time, and uh, William Bora was one of his heroes, and he wrote about him in a very um, flattering way. So he was. Uh, 
he was he wrote at a time when um, I think we're we're far more skeptical of of um, uh, the people we put on pedestals. We don't even put them up there, up there anymore, or if we do, for it's about a week, I guess I would say. Sure. But um, in the case, uh, his mother, uh, interesting, the Ruth, Ruth Newberger said to me that Dick was, uh, his, he was a hero worshiper. worshiper. Uh, and later in Bora's career, um, uh, it came out, some financial irregularities, as we put it, were, came out. And uh, Dick's uh, was a little shaken by that, I gather, in terms of his thinking that. And of course, he had the reality of, of knowing Wayne Morris in great day, and he wrote many pieces about Morris that one would say were quite flattering. Uh, and yet, and yet, he had quite a reverse experience with Morris. So, it, it was a combination. He he knew the bitter reality of a lot of things, but at the same time, and I have to say, when he had cancer, he did something that was quite rare at the time. He wrote about it. Uh, and his article in the Atlantic was what when I learned that I got cancer well in those days uh, in the 50s it was generally a deep dark secret within families and wasn't spoken about sure mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, only with Betty Ford for instance do we later does that come out in terms of, of women and breast cancer for instance so it was one other way he was he was uh, ahead of his time but also I think very self-conscious about making his mark uh, in history. Jane, how about Abigail? I know Abigail, uh, we learned from the book, had her own special day at the Lewis and Clark Exposition of 1905, uh, put on by the infamous brother. I thought that was kind of a nice yeah. bone right there at the, <laughs> to throw the sister. I know we fight all the time and disagree, but how about I make this really special day for you at this you know, worldwide exposition? Um, it's a little bit different for her because she's she's kind of risen to a national level and and then been forcibly pushed back behind the curtain. Um, what do you think her sense was of her own um, her own legacy at the end? Well, I think she had a, a, a great sense of legacy. She uh, she published the first commercially published book in Oregon in 1859 that when Oregon became a state and it got terrible reviews and in her biography she writes about that she was just at the time was devastated that um, that people didn't like the book and and later 20 some years later when she starts the first newspaper she mentions in the original kind of discussion of what kind of a newspaper it's going to be um, that she had gotten these bad reviews and she says and and they and they were deserved but I have improved, and so I think she um, she wanted people to see her as this uh, important person. Uh, she loved Cynthia Applegate, by the way, um, Greg, and um, and Jesse was supportive of women's rights. Um, but she talked about how people longingly talked about Cynthia after she died, and I think Abigail wanted that kind of adoration, and at the same time, she knew that. Um, she couldn't not. She couldn't earn that in the same way because her personality was such, and her mission was such that she couldn't. Um, she couldn't survive the um, time it would take to be more diplomatic and to be more um, persuasive and personal in that sense. She just was quick, and it was almost as though she knew she didn't have a lot of time. I don't know if in part that was because she was a mother of, you know. Uh, five children, and that takes an enormous amount of energy out of you, and she had all these jobs, and then after Ben was hurt, she uh, was the caregiver for him. So I, I think she wanted to be remembered, um, and wanted to be remembered well, and that's why when she was in her 80s when she wrote her, um, her own uh, memoir, basically, where she goes over all of these events and tries to you know, put the spin on it that she would want. So I, I think she knew people would read that, um, and of course, once they were successful, it was um, it was something she hoped that people would always remember. Sadly, um, she's not even mentioned in in a lot of the women's suffrage um, surveys that are done, mostly written by Eastern authors. But she's not even mentioned in them. Mm -hmm. And yet, for us in here in the West, 
she was incredibly important and she was um, both gifted and exceptional and I think she knew that. Very interesting, yes. So we do have a question from the audience. If we can put it up on our screen there. Um, is the Applegate Valley outside of Grants Pass named after Jesse? Quick answer, yes it is. Um, yes, I don't know, I can't tell you when it was so named, but it was named for Jesse. The Applegate Trail came through that area. Um, at the time it wasn't called the Applegate Trail, it was called the Southern Route. And it might more appropriately be almost considered the Applegate Scott Trail, because Levi Scott, who also lived in, the, in Oregon at the time, had an awful lot to do with the success of the Applegate Trail. Oh, wow. Applegate Valley incidentally is beautiful. I've been there a number of times. Well, this has been fascinating. Uh, these are three very interesting uh, historical figures in Oregon, and we have four very talented authors here in the room tonight. So the book is called Eminent Oregons, Oregonians, mm -hmm. Three Who, Matter, Who Mattered. And I want to thank uh, Steve Forrester, Jane Kirkpatrick, Greg Noakes, and Kelly Cannon Miller for their participation in the panel tonight. Uh, thank you. Very wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Jerry.